your girl Flip Simon, and I am doing a movie message divination. This is something um, that I coined myself, movie message, but I did not come up with divination. It is an old ancient tool to connect with spirit, spirit also known as source, the divine, God, the universe, Allah, you know, all that is. Um, so movie message is something that I have not seen, seen many people doing. It's when you find a deeper meaning in a movie. Today we're going to be doing Kung Fu, ugh, why is that? And I'm thinking Kung Fu Hustle then Kung Fu Panda, but no, it is Beverly Hills Ninja, okay? <laughs> and um, if you ever want me to do a movie message for your favorite movie, for a popular movie, you can just um, shoot me a DM. I do read DMs. I mean, I haven't reached that tolerance to where I'm like, fuck this shit, so I'm still doing it. Um, I just block you if you want to bullshit. That's just how it go. So today we're going to do movie message divination for the movie Beverly Hills Ninja, and the star of that movie is uh, Chris Farley, rest in peace. If you want me to do a movie, such as your favorite movie, a popular movie on Netflix or uh, any other streaming service, you just shoot me a DM and I'll do that for you. Okay, so I just wanted to hop right into it. Um, when the movie first comes on, it's orange and yellow, so those are the chakras, like a uh, sacral chakra and solar plexus chakra. And the solar plexus chakra is all about identity. I've never seen this movie before, and I was going to do a top movie that was on Netflix, but none of them was speaking to me. So this movie was rec in my recommend recommended so i chose this one okay so the orange and yellow chakras had already told me that this was like about finding identity and finding something that gives you drive and passion okay so chris farley um was an orphan like his parents died at sea and his parents was like rich so he was like a privileged kid his parents died at sea and he was found by a group of ninjas and um in a trunk <laughs> and it just made me think about moses and how he washed up on shore but he really wasn't an orphan. His parents gave him away for a better life, but I guess it's something like an orphan. But it triggered me to think of Moses, okay? And so, the white baby in a trunk. I, I took notes. Okay, so the white baby in a trunk made me think of treasure, right? But they had this uh, great saying that one day they would come across a great white ninja. And it's like literally, Chris Farley, like he's white, right? And um, he was going to be like the best ninja ever. His name was Haru. Okay. And um, as he was growing up in the dojo, he was a fuck up. He couldn't get nothing right. Um... He had a brother named Gobe, and he was just like the bomb. Like he was, you know, the status quo of what a ninja is and could be or should attain to, right? Okay. So it just made me think of gentrification at first because he was a white boy in this dojo, and it's like an infiltration of a culture that is not yours. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know. White people love to come and take shit and claim shit that's not theirs. I'm sorry if you're offended. Um, in this society, that is the role that white people play as a programming. I mean, it's, it's not you. You can do away with this program and wake up to realize that you are just like other people, just like everybody else. Um, so they had a little scene where they was like, all ninjas can communicate with each other on this high realm. I put telepathy, but it's really like astral projection. And Chris Farley, Haru, he sucked at this shit. Like, he would go all the way out of his body. He was just going through so many dimensions. And so when it was time for him to come back to his body, he would just like explode, like his spirit, his body, he would just fall over or go through a wall or something like that. Okay, so the sensei, you know, asked uh, Haru, Chris Farley, asked his brother, Go Gay, um, so what you think about, you know, Haru and becoming a ninja? Because it's their time, you know, to uh, be initiated. And he was like, being all nice. And he's like, yeah, he's nice. I love my brother. He's like, no, tell me what you really think. He's like, he's fat, he's dead, he's dead, he doesn't deserve to be a ninja. So his dad did not make him a ninja based upon his brother's words. Okay? So they made me feel like, you know, there was, you know, Haru is an orphan already, and he's the only one that's different. He sticks out like a sore thumb. He can't get shit right, so he's not accepted. And it's like a form of rejection. Like, he's constantly reminded of his differences, and then he don't fit in, and he doesn't belong here. Okay, so yeah, I wrote down made aware of differences. So then, um, they go on a mission, and they leave him there to guard the dojo. And so while he's guarding the dojo, he's playing around, and he breaks three mirrors. By accident. Not out of anger or anything, but it was by accident, because he was a cuss. So... To me, they represented the mind, body, and soul. Like, he has become, like, distorted. And at, at that time, when he became distorted, it was like uh, a white lady walked in. She, and she came on all white. It was a lady in all white. She walked in. She was looking for help. She was looking for a ninja. She needed somebody to go on a mission for her. And um, the, in that scene, it was a contrast because she was all white. She was white in all white. And he was white in all black. And it was like the shadow and the light. It was like he was in the darkness and she, she was this beacon of light. Like right there when he felt distorted, like the mirror, and she walks like this beacon of light. He called her Dove, Lady Dove, 
or something like that. We just it's like symbolic of hope, peace, harmony. Okay. She was like, "You're white. How are you a ninja?" He was, and this is like a phrase they use at the movie. Don't be fooled by the color of my skin. I like that, and that's when it made me feel like this wasn't about gentrification. This was about coming of age, finding yourself, finding your rightful place in the world, not rejecting where you came from, but using that as a stepping stone and uh, finding your true place. Okay. So she chose him to help her because at that time she really had nobody to compare him to in order to dismiss him, you know, in order to say, oh no, I won't go back, not how you know, so she had nobody to compare, nobody else was there, you know, to help her, so she chose him, was like, can you help me? So this was his opportunity to prove himself. And so while he was trying to flaws and flex, he was just fucking up. He burned the script and I wrote down, it was like the burning of the script, it was a story about the great white ninja. I, I wrote that it was symbolic of rewriting the history. Um, but as I went through the movie, I don't know what symbolism it held because the movie kind of changed. But the burning of the script could be like a form of rejection because he doesn't feel like the great white ninja. Okay. And uh, he was flexing, right? He flexing and he almost uh, messed up a shelf. And he was like, look, it's with me. And I'm like, nigga, my bad. <laughs> oh, fuck. Look, it's not with you because you just broke three mirrors. Right? And then as soon as I said that, like, the shelf broke and it was, like, ashes. Ashes, ashes. We all fall down. Okay, so, like, we all fall down, but the thing is to get back up again. Um, but from that symbolism, I was like, look, it's not with him because he just broke three mirrors. And I was like, dumping up the ashes. So, to me, there was symbolism of, like, ancestors, maybe? Ancestors, like, yes, it's time to take this call of action. You know, this uh, probably a way of ancestors speaking to him. Okay, so he took the mission, and she was like, she wanted him to spy on her man. She, don't, she wanted to know what's going on with him. So he did it, and come to find out the dude was trying to make counterfeit, counterfeit yen. Okay? So then that's when I wrote, oh, this is a coming-of-age story, because he's getting ready to go on a journey. He ended up, you know, leaving Japan and going to uh, Beverly Hills. And so when he went, he thought he was just going on his journey by himself, and his uh, sensei told Gobei to go with him. But, you know, don't let him know that you're there. Be there with him, but don't be seen. So, to me, Gobei represents um, a guardian angel or spirit, you know? It's like you always know that something is there helping you, but you can't just like put your finger on it. It's like, dang, I'm always being assisted, you know, by this invisible thread or whatever. I put a uh, false sense of freedom because he thought he was doing all these things on his own. And I, I felt like it was bad. When I was watching, I was like, wow, he's supposed to go out here and, and make a way and find a way for himself, but he's being handicapped by his, you know, perfect brother, Gobei. Okay, so he gets to Beverly Hills and he goes to the hotel and his daddy gave him a bunch of gold coins and he tries to rent a room. They're all depressed because he got money. And then Chris Rock was, uh, his name was Joey. He was a bellhop. And uh, his scene made me realize that uh, the movie puts, in the movie, part of the lesson was um, not to put money over people, you know, not to put profit over people, people before profit. And um, so it was like Haru found his tribe. It was like he found his tribe where he could help others. But the way that he was helping, because he was impressing Joey, which was the deal hop, he was impressing him. And so that gave him some esteem because he felt like he was making a difference in somebody's life. What he had to offer mattered to the world. And so he didn't do it correctly because he was only learning from the sensei who was authority figure in his life. And so he didn't really... Uh, treat Joey as he should have been treated and it made me think of how when we are working and we say when we become a manager we're not going to act like our manager and then as soon as we become a manager we do the same thing we forget how it felt to be a co-worker up under the manager and we treat the co-workers the same as the manager treated us you know I, I wrote people need to be able to be of service to feel valued uh, Joey Chris Rock was his mentee okay so Haru ended up <laughs> changing his clothes, you know, he ended up going to get like a more Beverly Hills outfit, which ended up being a pimp outfit, which I thought was funny. Uh, a pimp, dressed as a pimp to come save a hoe, LOL, Captain Save a Hoe. Because <laughs> that seemed like what he was doing. He was like, I just have to help her, I have to save her, this is my mission, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay, he's supposed to be a ninja, and he's supposed to be stealth, and like he was not very incognito. He drove a red flashy car, and he had a pimp's mouth, you know? Also, it was a scene where he went to a strip club and he was supposed to be spying um, on the girl's boyfriend. 
with the counterfeit money, but he got distracted because he's a virgin. So it was like temptation, distraction. So then later he felt like uh, he was fucking up. So he did meditation, astral projection, and talks with Sensei. And he was like, you could just look her up in a phone book. And I was like, oh my God, phone book. This movie is so dated. It's like nostalgia. So I wrote his brother as a garden angel because his brother was like bomb. He was so self that it was fucking me up. I was like, damn. He was a statue. He also did cross dress, and I didn't even know it was him. I wrote, oh, okay. So he went to go talk to the girl when he found when he looked up looked her up in the phone book. He looked her up by a boyfriend's name, which is Tab. Uh, and come find out the boyfriend killed her sister. So she had a fake name. She was trying to infiltrate and prove that he killed her sister. And so at that moment, it was like Haru grew more confidence in himself because he knew that his intuition was accurate. Because it was something that his, his sensei had said, you cannot even discern truth from untruth. And so he took that as truth because he felt like he could not, because he was a fuck up, he couldn't get it right. He was not like his brother though, babe. So at that moment, there was more confidence growing in that, oh, I was right, I'm on to something. I knew it, you know? Oh, and the so uh, there was a scene where they go to a Japanese restaurant and Haru is acting like he a, a chef and he fuck it up, right? Then they have a fight scene. And that's when you find out that the brother was there and he was dressed in drag. And I was like, what the fuck? I did not even know that was him. It was so good. And so the girl come and try to save him. And then they end up running out of the restaurant. And then they go to his hotel. And, you know, he's trying to have sex with her. But, you know, she's like, no. And he's like, man, I just want to <laughs> get them goodies. So there was a little scene where she goes behind his door. And she takes off her robe. And it's like a silhouette challenge. It was so funny. I was like, silhouette challenge, laughing my ass off. He, and then I was like, oh, he's just trying to get to first base. And so then they go to um, the place where the bank man is at, that he's going to help make the counterfeit. They give him some mushrooms. They make him tell the truth about what's going on. And then Haru uh, impersonates the bank man when uh, Mr. Tally, the boy, the girl's boyfriend, pops up. And so then he tries to, uh, he gets to the place where he is making the bank notes of the yen. And he uh, he makes them all loud, vibrant colors. And it's, it's orange and yellow, right? <laughs> so... He makes them them code and say, like, what the fuck? And he's trying to steal the plates to um, make the counterfeit money, and then he gets caught. And so his brother has to help him there. So his brother was, like, all throughout the movie, his saving grace. So, uh, they get caught, and they kidnap the girl. They was finna arrest Haru, but his brother did a smoke diversion, and he went to jail instead of Haru. And, uh, it was one scene where the girl was on the payphone, and I was like, holy fucking shit, a payphone? Okay. So, um, what ended up happening is he ended up talking to his sensei again, and he was like, you know, you are a ninja, and I didn't want you to do this, but I feel, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm really busy. I feel you need to do this, and so, he was like, your brother Gobe has to learn heart, and you have heart, you know, and until Gobe can learn heart, he can never be like a true ninja, and that's when I was like, wow, support goes a long way. If somebody believes they are something, then you should believe that they are something. There's no reason to go against a person and what they believe in if it's not hurting them. You know, that it empowers them. That somebody they love believes in him. So, I was like, wow, support goes a long way. I said, the belief his dad had in him helps him have belief in joy. And this when um, he went and took joy on as like a sidekick and was like, come on, work with me, do this with me. And so, that's like, the person in the upper management is going to forever produce bad seeds. They're going to um, promote into management because management has to change first. It's just like being a parent. A parent has to change first to see any difference in their kid. Okay? So eventually, um, Gobe, you know, when it was really needed, he revealed that he was there. And it was like toward the end of the movie. And uh, it just made me feel like teamwork make the dream work. And it was also saying that you never have to really be there to help people in their bullshit. You know, you can help from afar. You can be, you know, distant support, but still be supportive. And, but when they really, really need you, be there. But you have to be discerning to know when is it that time when you come in. It's like, damn, you came in just to make a time. Time, it's all about time. So eventually, um, his brother was about to get beat up. It was like so many people surrounding him, and he, he didn't know what to do. And that's when Haru just got this motivation to become when he always was destined to become. Okay, and then he made a destiny. Uh, the great white ninja. It's like, the threat, I put proper motivation would have you kicking some ass. A threat to something you love will bring out the beast in you. He said, I don't know this and I don't know that, but I know. Don't fuck with my brother. He loved his brother unconditionally. Wow, okay. So in that time, that was like integration. 
I know they're two separate people, but that was like integration of darkness and light. In the movie, um, Haru wore white and his brother Obey wore black because he was always the serious one and Haru was always the goofy one. So at that moment, they were integrated and they became one. It was like no more rejection of this side of myself. I'm now going to become that motherfucker that I need to be to get shit done. Or, you know, I'm now going to, you know, relax and let my brother shine, right? So at that moment, Gobei was watching Haru and was reading him on. And so towards the end, he saved the girl. And uh, he blew up the uh, the plates or the counterfeit money. And he was like, you know, for a minute there, I was doubting myself. <laughs> it was so funny. It was like, and I wrote, never doubt yourself. You are capable of all you put your mind to. And then at the end, it was doing like a press. And Chris Rock, Joey was talking. And he was like, you know, I'm the black ninja. He's like, for real? Hey, just look at you. We wouldn't be able to tell. He was like, don't be fooled by the color of my skin. 